Good afternoon on this gorgeous afternoon, and welcome to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum. Uh, I'm Tom Schwartz, the director of the Hoover. If you enjoy programs like the one today, please consider joining the Hoover Presidential Foundation. There is a table outside manned by uh, two ladies that are uh, active members of the foundation. And uh, the foundation serves as our support group because without them, programs like these wouldn't be possible. Uh, they also provide funding for our temporary exhibits and our education programs and our website. So being a supporter of the foundation means you're a great supporter of us. It allows you to have unlimited free admission as long as your membership's valid here as well as any of the other 13 presidential libraries in the National Archives and Records Administration system. So um, it's, it's a good deal. Uh, now, on to our speaker. I first met Betty Ellison in my previous position as Illinois State Historian and Director of Research and Collections for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Springfield. Uh, it was a telephone call in which she described her research on Mary Lincoln. Her call was the first in a series of research queries that culminated in this book, The True Mary Lincoln. Honing her research skills, oh, by the way, this is available for purchase afterwards in our museum store, and she'd be happy to sign copies. I have asked nicely. Um, <laughs> Honing her research skills, first as a reporter and then as a writer for state government, Ellison is the author of numerous books. Among them are an investigative inquiry into the University of Kentucky Athletics entitled Kentucky's Domain of Power, Greed and Corruption, a study of Kentucky's popular beverage, 200 years of Kentucky moonshine, <laughs> and a biography of a prominent 19th century figure, a man seen but once, Cassius Marsilius Clay. She also recently completed a book about stock car racing called The Early Laps, which is the first in, I believe, two volumes, a history of, of stock car racing. While there are many biographies of Mary Lincoln, Ellison is the first to base her conclusions upon newly discovered archival materials that previous biographers have overlooked. I always like that because having been in archives my whole life, it's not that these records are new. They have been sitting there awaiting for someone to look at them and to realize what they say. Uh, and Betty has done that throughout this book taken records that had been available to all of previous biographers, and yet she was the only one being industrious enough to actually seek out the records and learn about the truths that they contained. It is this appreciation for rooting out all and examining all of the original source materials that sets Betty Ellison's study apart from any other study of Mary Lincoln. And with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Betty Ellison. Thank you very much, Tom. What an honor it is to be here in this magnificent Herbert Hoover <laughs> Presidential Library and Museum and to talk with you today about Mary Lincoln. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She was sassy, she was sophisticated, sarcastic as could be, intelligent, attractive, temperamental, and with all those attributes, it's not surprising that Abraham Lincoln fell in love with Mary Todd when they met in Springfield, Illinois. Did I mention that she was also frugal? An influential and well-established Lexington, Kentucky businessman, Robert Smith Todd schooled his daughter well in both politics and business. 
She listened carefully and learned how to manage family financing and understood the political world as well as most men and better than some. For 153 years, Mary Lincoln has been branded as a spendthrift as a result of erroneous newspaper articles, some of which listed expensive clothing and furnishings in detail that she supposedly purchased from New York mercantile establishments she never visited. Those publications, of course, did not mention the real villains in the executive mansion expenditure were William S. Wood and Benjamin B. French. How could this have happened to a woman who was intelligent, politically astute, and compassionate, but she was also tight-fisted with money. However, whenever she could, she gave as much as possible to those in needs. Pennsylvania Senator Simon Cameron, during the debate over increasing her presidential pension, answered that question. Those who dislike or disagreed with the president and his policies, he said, chose from the beginning to make his wife their target because they lacked the courage to directly attack President Lincoln. Those attacks, along with the erroneous newspaper accounts, accused her of overspending her $20,000 congressional furnishings allowance for the executive mansion during the Civil War. An incompetent 1932 biographer who wanted to use her expended, supposed expenditures in an attempt to prove Mary Lincoln was insane added his voice to the course. She was 43 years old when the Lincolns moved to the executive mansion, and this was not Mary Lincoln's first time on the dance floor. Despite having the educational equivalent of a graduate degree and growing up in an affluent Lexington household, she experienced some hard economic times in the early years of their marriage. Then it was just the two of them against the world, living in the sparsely furnished rooms in Springfield's Globe Hotel. Mary and Abraham were, were happy as they settled down and made their future plans. A lot of those were political plans. This was a woman who, in the first year after the Lincolns purchased their Springfield home, bought 98 yards of fabric from John Irwin's store to make draperies, linens, and clothes for her family. And she sewed every yard of that on her fingers. And additional yardage. The calluses on her hands from sewing, scrubbing, washing, cleaning, and other household chores went with her to the executive mansion. This was a woman who refused to pay 15 cents for three pints of blackberries. She offered 10 cents. Mary Lincoln declined her hired girl's request for a 75 cent raise. Her husband overruled her in both cases. This was a woman who managed their finances while her husband traveled the court circuit six months out of the year and was on the campaign trail. She was the managing partner, wrote Henry Rankin, one of Lincoln's law clerks, who kept the expense accounts within the limits which their modest budget placed at her disposal. This was a woman who held on to 80 acres of the Illinois land her father gave her for 12 years before selling it to pay for enlarging their Springfield home. This was a woman whose frugality, coupled with Lincoln's financial expertise, gave them cash assets of $14,000 before they went to Washington in February 1861. Today, that $14,000 would be $382,000. They had the money to pay for the purchases Mary made during her January 1861 shopping trip to New York. They didn't have to buy on credit. Nobody really knows whether they did or not. Yet, William A. Evans, a physician who wrote a biography of Mary Lincoln in 1932, insisted the trip was a wild shopping spree as she abused their line of credit. Evans offered no evidence of receipts 
credit or otherwise to prove his point. Evans also neglected to mention that among Mary's major purchases were an overcoat and a new top hat for her husband. He droned on about her buying clothes and jewelry for herself without any specific documentation. It was her husband who bought a set of pearl jewelry for her from Tiffany's as the inaugural train trip went through New York. Mary Lincoln treasured that jewelry and wore it often. Later, the president bought her diamonds. Another of Evans' claims regarding Mary Lincoln's shopping trip is too far-fetched for anything but rebuttal. And I am happy to rebut it. <laughs> he claims she bought lace curtains for the executive mansion on that New York trip in, 1860, in January 1861. Keep in mind, she didn't move into the executive mansion until March 1861. Mary Lincoln was an executive was an excellent seamstress who knew it was necessary to know the size of the windows before you purchased the curtains. If she accompanied her congressman husband to the executive mansion during the James K. Polk administration, I'm here to tell you she didn't whip out a tape measure and climb up and measure the East Room windows. <laughs> After the Lincolns moved into the residence, she did order lace curtains for the East Room windows. Lincoln's political detractors, Evans' inaccurate statements, and equally erroneous newspaper reports formed the basis of the false assumption that Mary Lincoln was a spendthrift. Keep in mind the newspapers of the 1860s were party, political party publications. Some were even owned by the parties. And it was always open season on the opposition. Consequently, for me, nagging unanswered questions about the First Lady's personal and executive expenditures were never answered. But the answer was found one winter afternoon in the National Archives in Washington, where it lay unnoticed for decades upon decades. There it was. In an 1861 Department of Interior check register, my elation came close to disturbing the rigidly enforced quiet of the archives. <laughs> the archivist with me gasped a little more discreetly. He said in his 40 years with the archives, to his knowledge, no one writing about the Lincolns had ever asked to see that particular document. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. The check register was undeniable proof that the excessive spending of the Congressional Furnishings Fund was not due to the mismanagement of Mary Lincoln, but that of William S. Wood, Interim Commissioner of Public Buildings, who came to Washington with a New York political machine of William Seward and Thurlow Weed. Commissioners of Public Buildings since the Adams administration were in charge of not only the executive mansion, but the Capitol, other government buildings, the district's roads, streets, and parks. They handle an enormous amount of taxpayers' money. They also had a long history of graft and corruption. Samuel Lane, President James Monroe's commissioner, left the furnishing funds $20,000 in arrears when he died in 1822. In fact, $1,600 of that had been spent on wine and whiskey. Maybe that left, led to Lane's early demise. <laughs> Monroe uh, spent his entire 20000 congressional furnishings money on French furniture, wallpaper, chandeliers, porcelain, silver, and paying the shipping bill from France. Congress had to appropriate an additional $30,000 to furnish the president's house, as it was then called. Monroe overspent his congressional furnishings allowance by at least $50,000. Today, that would be $1.06 million. And he did so while the nation was still repaying the debts from the War of 1812. 
From 1796 to 1861, when Mary and Abraham Lincoln arrived at the executive mansion, the government had spent $1.3 billion in today's money for furnishings for the official residence. <coughs> From 1807 to 1860, commissioners of public buildings requested and received from Congress an amount today that would be $1.5 billion for repairs. President Franklin Pierce named James J. Lee an engineer to handle his $25,000 furnishings allowance. Lee, recognizing his inadequacies for the job, consulted with capital architect Thomas Walters. Their shopping list for A.T. Stewart's department store read like an order for a new hotel. Walters said the residents had never been in such good shape. Pierce's commissioner of public buildings, William M. Easby, was reluctant to pay the Stewart bill for good reason. Easby, as was his practice, had withdrawn a large amount of money in cash from the account and stashed it in a friend's safe. There was no money to pay the Stewart bill. Easby resigned and Pierce appointed Benjamin B. French, one of his assistant secretaries, to the position. Six months after the Capitol architect had pronounced the residence in fine fashion, Smith asked, uh, French asked and received $16,000 from Congress for repairs. Where Lee recognized his limitations, French, an entrenched bureaucrat, knew just how to work the system. Dolly Madison took a personal interest in furnishing the rebuilt president's house after it was burned by the British in 1814. But no first lady before Mary Lincoln personally selected furnishings and fabrics for the executive mansion and supervised their installation. Mary Lincoln recommended that her, appoint, her husband appoint William S. Wood, Commissioner of Public Buildings, because of his successful organizing and supervising the long, winding inaugural train trip from Springfield to Washington. He made the trains run on time. Her usual shrewd judgment of people failed her in this instance. Wood came to Washington with one idea, getting rich. Wood succeeded James B. Blake, who was unsuccessful in curbing the furnishings expenditure of President James Buchanan's niece, Harriet Lane. Congress had to appropriate an additional $12,000 for her after she spent the initial $20,000 furnishing allowance, and she was buying furniture to replace the elegant French furniture that Monroe bought that she sent to an auction house. The Senate refused to confirm Wood, who served in an interim capacity from May through August 1861, the time frame in which Mary Lincoln was acquiring furnishings for the residents. At the same time, Benjamin French was aggressively lobbying the president for Wood's job. Suddenly, there was no money in the furnishings account to pay the Carrill brothers' invoice of $6,858. There was a good reason for that shortage, and it had absolutely nothing to do with Mary Lincoln. In July and August of 1861, William S. Wood wrote three checks to himself totaling $7,700. The notation in the check register read, quote, to pay self, small bills, and salaries, end quote. Wood, however, did not use the money for that purpose. Special congressional appropriations were needed to cover those expenses and salaries. After only four months, Wood left the office with a deficit of 81000 $444, which today would be $1.69 So apparently he did get rich. <laughs> Those checks which Wood wrote to himself are indisputable evidence that Mary Lincoln did not overspend her congressional furnishings allowance. 
Lincoln told his wife in September 1861 about Wood's long list of, what shall we say, improprieties, and she was livid. He also told her he was appointing French to the position. In public, French was most accommodating and complimentary to the First Lady. In private, he made snide, backbiting remarks about her in his journal. He thought it was beneath him that she required him to be present at all the reception and levies to introduce guests to her. But even French admitted that Mary Lincoln was careful with the dollar, and that, to some extent, kept him in line. French had another annoying habit of snooping around the executive mansion. When the president was not in residence, French made himself at home in Lincoln's office, claimed he liked to read there. French wrote in his journal that he broke the news to Lincoln in 18, December 1861 about the $6,858 overage in the furnishings account, and he did so at the First Lady's request. French claimed he was trying to protect Mary Lincoln by breaking the news to her husband. The president, French wrote in his journal, was outraged at the expenditure and pledged to pay it all from his own money. None of that was true. Both Lincolns knew in September 1861 about the overage and the checks Wood wrote to himself, which led to his dismissal. French's attempt to advance the date of the overage discovery by four months and to claim an imaginary conversation with Abraham Lincoln completely destroys the man's credibility. French, however, was undeterred. He plowed ahead. He even saw himself as a clothing critic. He wrote in his journal about Mary Lincoln wearing a lace shawl valued at $2,500, intimating that she had paid that amount for it. Her second inaugural gown, which was very beautiful and very expensive, was a gift had a lace overdress and a matching point lace shawl. From the hue and cry Mary Lincoln's critics made over her gowns, one would think they paid for them themselves. What difference did it make what the Lincolns paid for her clothes? It wasn't public money. But she was a no-win situation in Washington. Many of the citizens were still Southern sympathizers. If she bought a new gown for every occasion, there was a spendthrift label. If she made alterations to her gowns, she was just an ignorant Illinois housewife with no sense of fashion. From March 1861 to April 1865, Mary Lincoln's schedule included 105 official events which called for formal dress. Those events did not include her official appearances outside of Washington. If, as her secretary, William O. Stoddard, said, she purchased 12 to 14 gowns a year, mostly from New York dressmakers, then the First Lady wrote, wore those gowns on multiple occasions and made many alterations to them. Then there was the outrage over what Mary Lincoln wore to Senator Edward Baker's funeral. Baker, the only United States Senator to be killed in battle, was a close and dear friend of the Lincolns. <coughs> Mary Lincoln named their second son for him. Lincoln chose Baker, not David Davis or anyone else from Illinois, to introduce him at his first inaugural. Mary Lincoln was quite familiar with morning wear. Having lost their second son a month shy of his fourth birthday, her beloved grandmother, Elizabeth Parker, and her father within three years span. She chose to wear a lilac gown and bonnet and gloves to Baker's funeral, and the Washington social critics went wild. They viewed her choice of attire as a blunder of such enormous proportions that it was the equivalent of her having climbed astride one of the horses pulling the case on. Those critics, according to one historian, sent a representative to speak to the First Lady about the impropriety of her dress. Now that would have been a very interesting conversation 
as Mary Lincoln, when she chose, had a rapier sharp tongue. This was a woman who instructed her New York milliner, Ruth Harris, to create a bonnet for her, not costing more than five dollars. That's seventy-five dollars in today's money, which would hardly buy a custom-designed hat. This was a woman who purchased clothing, footwear, and accessories for her entire family. Two young sons until Willie died when he was 11, her husband whose clothes had to be tailored, and for herself. All those bills from New York department stores were not just for Mary Lincoln. This was a woman who bought white kid gloves in lots of 300 pairs. A rather frugal move considering the Lincoln shook hands with thousands of people during a single event. At their first reception in March 1861, a crowd estimated at 8,000 people poured into the residence. Lincoln, timed by a man in attendance, shook hands at the rate of 25 per minute, or 1,500 per hour. Mary Lincoln could not match her husband as she often paused to chat with guests. A gentleman, one of the receptions, which all of which were open to the public, recalled shaking hands with the first lady. Although she wore gloves, he said, her hands were not soft. Both Lincolns wore white kid gloves for those events. Cleanliness was rather lax in those days, and it was considered an affront to greet guests with soiled gloves. Consequently, they changed gloves often during an event. Even in the 21st century, Mary Lincoln's critics continue to criticize her bulk purchase of guns as an extravagance. Did they bother to consider whether there were two sizes of gloves, one small, the other extra large in that order? Mary Lincoln's critics often ignored the gifts, fruit, and flowers that she took from the residence greenhouse and conservatory when she visited with wounded soldiers. And she spent an enormous amount of time visiting with those soldiers, writing letters for, for them, taking guests with her, sometimes her husband, uh, people like Abner Doubleday, uh, Gideon Wells and his wife Mary Jane, Gifts of wine and whiskey sent to the executive mansion were redirected by the First Lady to numerous hospitals around Washington, which were often short on anesthetic for surgeries. Despite the advice of William Stoddard to take reporters with her to those hospital visits to improve her image, she refused to make media events out of her interaction with men wounded in their efforts to save the Union. Considering the avalanche of accusations against her, Mary Lincoln did achieve success as a First Lady, in part by refusing to answer her critics publicly. She was socially astute, so it was difficult for her detractors to find fault there. But they did love to make fun of her clothes. Both Lincolns considered the executive mansion was the people's house a symbol of the nation and treated it as such. Her refurbishing of the state rooms was intended to send a message to visiting foreign dignitaries that the Union was, was strong and under President's leadership it would survive. Considering all the occupants who've lived in the executive mansion now known as the White House, over a century and a half later the furnishings and the Lincoln bedroom, with few exceptions, remain relatively intact as she left them. Her selection of china and crystal were used by many succeeding generations. After 1861, Mary Lincoln purchased no more furniture for the residence. Only replacement items of china and crystal were ordered. It was also necessary to repair damage to window treatments and, and furniture, uh, which the visitors like to take as souvenirs. When they held receptions during inclement weather, she used canvas to cover the carpets, such as a custom loomed 100 by 40 foot one piece rug in the East Room. During one 
reception, General Ulysses S. Grant came in and those attended demanding a glimpse of him. Well, Grant climbed on a sofa so the people could see him. The First Lady also saw him. She hurriedly sent an aide to request his presence in the reception line. As long as Abraham Lincoln was alive, she could withstand the slurs, innuendos, and accusations because she understood that those who opposed her husband chose a weakling's course of attacking her instead. Once Lincoln was assassinated, those accusations and new ones did considerable damage to her fiscal well-being. Some of the problems she encountered in widowhood were of her own making. She exhibited a sense of entitlement that offended many. But there was no changing Mary Lincoln's personality. She dug in her heels, refused to be defeated, waged the fight of her life up to that point, and showed the measure and plumb of a survivor. She knew who her friends were and turned to them for assistance. They included Pennsylvania Senator Simon Cameron, who helped her financially, wealthy Philadelphians James and Sally Orne, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, who often accompanied the Lincolns to the opera and worked for a presidential pension, journalist Noel Brooks, German banker Joseph Siegelman, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells and his wife Mary Jane, editor and publisher Horace Greeley, Prince Felipe de Orleans, the Cop de Paris, Louis Sayer, America's first outstanding orthopedist, and her personal physician, Generals Philip Sheridan, Robert Allen, and others who assisted her with funds, used their influence for behalf, on her behalf, and gave her moral support. Without consulting his widow, a group of men from Illinois decided the slain president should be buried in, down, in a downtown Springfield memorial, where there was no place for his family's interment. A group of congressmen wanted him buried under the Capitol Dome in the empty vault built for George Washington. Shortly before his death, Lincoln told his wife that he wanted to be buried in a quiet country cemetery. The men from Illinois, with the approval of Robert Lincoln, proceeded with plans for the downtown Springfield burial and memorial. Although consumed with grief, Mary Lincoln informed them if they did not adhere to her wishes, she would have her husband buried in Washington's empty vault. She won her point and selected the Oak Ridge Cemetery outside of Springfield as his final resting place. In doing so, she did what she'd probably done most of her life. She stepped on a lot of prominent political toes. It took Mary Lincoln five weeks to pull herself together pack and move out of the executive mansion. During that period, the residence was wide open. Scavengers came in, took what they wanted and could carry from the state room. Because Benjamin French was much too busy ingratiating himself with President Andrew Johnson to be concerned with the theft of government property. During Johnson's term, French managed to wangle $130,000 from Congress allegedly spent on furnishings and repairs for the mansion. Today that would be $2.06 million. After Mary Lincoln departed Washington, French delivered his final blow. He publicly announced she had removed furnishings belonging to the government from the residence. Journalist Noah Brooks visited the former First Lady frequently before she moved to Chicago, and he adamantly denied French's accusations. Brooks said she took only items belonging to her family and gifts the presidential couple had received while Lincoln was in office. This was a woman who assumed all the couple's financial obligations. So the president, who died without a will, would have no debts attached to his name. While she agreed with her oldest son, Robert, to David Davis's appointment as administrator of the estate, it was a disaster for her. Davis appointed the Supreme Court by Lincoln 
handled the estate in a rather roughshod method. He filed no estate inventory as was required by Illinois law, made questionable disbursements, and allowed a relatively simple estate to linger for nearly three years before settlement. Mary Lincoln's decision to forego her widow's award allowed the estate to be divided equally between herself, Robert, and Tad, their youngest son. Davis's initial division of the state was hardly equitable. Robert received $7,267. His mother received $4,084, and his brother $1,586. And this is a point to keep in mind. When Davis made the final settlement of Lincoln's estate, the extra $3,183 that Robert Lincoln received was not deducted from his final settlement. Through the generosity of friends, Mary Lincoln was able to buy and furnish a roadhouse on Chicago's West Washington Street in 1866. Unfortunately, her annual income from her portion of the interest from Lincoln's estate was approximately $1,500 a year, and it was inadequate. In today's dollars, those funds were the equivalent of $19,000 just above the current poverty level for a family of two. When she attempted to raise funds for their living expenses, Davis counted, countered with public statements which were either untrue or at best half-truths, that she needed no financial assistance. Despite her pleadings, Robert, uh, Davis refused to answer estate funds as he did with Robert. Quote, the severe winner and the very high prices of everything, with the utter inability to meet expenses on so small an income, and no apparent prospects of a remedy, has determined me to end this folly of keeping house on a clerk's salary, and there is no other resource but giving up this house." End quote. She wrote to Davis in February 1867. Davis ignored her request. Consequently, Mary and Tad Lincoln were boarders for the rest of their lives. Desperate for funds, Mary Lincoln decided in September 1867 she could raise money by selling her clothes and jewelry. Only two months after that embarrassing disaster, Davis decided he could actually make a final settlement of Lincoln's estate. Her one-third portion of her husband's estate was $39,991. She used the money wisely. By May 1868, she paid all of their debts, owed no one, and decided she and Tad could live more economically in Europe where he could finish his education. In July 1870, Congress approved a $3,000 annual pension for her to be paid quarterly. Did Mary Lincoln spend that money foolishly? Absolutely not. She carefully selected her banker, Joseph Siegelman, from Frankfurt, Germany. He'd been a friend of her husband's, and she followed his advice. Later, she worked closely with Jacob Bunn, a banker from Springfield, in handling her money. After Tad's early death in 1871, Mary divided his $35,750 estate equally with Robert. When she died on June 15, 1861, she left an estate of $83,034. It's long past the time for the spendthrift label to be removed from Mary Lincoln's name and for her to be recognized for, along with many other admirable traits, her ability to handle her finances responsibly. How else could she have managed her money in order to leave an estate that today would be worth $1.96 million. Thank you. I think Betty would be willing to entertain questions. Uh, if you would raise your hand and wait until a microphone is passed to you before you ask your question. 
Did Mary Lincoln have a person, didn't she have a personal seamstress? Uh, she had several. A, a black lady? Uh, Elizabeth Keckley. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to the best of my ability, I found that Elizabeth Keckley made her several gowns mm -hmm. at the beginning of the first administration. Uh, after that, I don't think she made too terribly many. As Stoddard said, she bought most of them uh, from New York dressmakers. They were ordered six months in advance. Uh, that may sound like quite a bit of time, but garments in those days were rather complicated. And keep in mind that Mary Lincoln was barely five feet tall and weighed about 100 pounds. But uh, uh, Mrs. Cuthbert, who was on the executive mansion staff, also made some of her gowns. Okay. And when they became more affluent, she used uh, some Springfield dressmakers. Thank you. Yes. yes. She accumulated that amount of money at the end of her life, but had she, did any of that money come from her family through that estate because she came from a wealthy family? Uh, actually, uh, in, uh, I think it was 1842, her father started giving them a set amount of money every year until he died in 1849. And actually, uh, his uh, factory had caught fire and burned. Uh, his finances were sort of on the decline. And I think they only had, uh, they only received about 1000 or $1,200 from his estate. After leaving the White House, why were they not willing or able to return to their home in Springfield? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, the Springfield house was rented. Uh, I'm not sure that she had the, uh, a lot of their furniture was sold. They may have taken some of it when they moved to Washington in 1861. I think that that house probably held a lot of happy memories for her, and I don't think she wanted to go back there and live. Now that may say, seem like a contradiction, but that's where I'm leaning on that question. Does that answer you? Uh, several books I've read and I, I think I'm next. Uh, several books I've read indicated that she had been committed to a, 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 psych a psych psychiatric uh, institution for a period of time by her son Todd. What were their relationships, and was she, you know was she really having problems, or as I kind of induced when I read, he was just trying to put her away for a period of time. Well. Your first question, how would you feel if your son did that to you? <laughs> and uh, certainly it strained their relationship. Uh, I don't buy into the fact that she was a manic depressive, that she was crazy. I'm, she had migraine headaches without a doubt. But if you had a physician that liberally dosed you with chloral hydrate, which would drive a person out of their mind. And then that same physician is the primary witness in her insanity hearing. Wouldn't that raise a few questions? Yeah. Did that answer yours? Yes. Well, thank you so very much for coming today and allowing me to suggest to talk to you about Mary Lincoln, a woman I know not only admire, but I'm, I'm sure as you can tell, I feel passionate about her. And uh, 
But that is not to say she didn't have problems. She, like all the rest of us, Mary Lincoln was far from a perfect individual. But over the years, history sure has given her a bum rap. Just a reminder that uh, Betty's book is on sale in the museum store. She'd be happy to autograph it for you. I'm sure if you'd like to go up afterwards and ask a question uh, without the audience, she'd be happy to take more questions uh, afterwards. So let's give Betty a hand. <laughs>